Welcome to the, to the debate on the future of energy. We have a number of uh, distinguished guests here to discuss what, what's going to happen with energy in the world over the next few years, over the next few decades. In fact, we're looking at a time when uh, uh, we see a changing world in energy. We see uh, prices of oil that uh, used to be uh, over $100 a barrel collapsing to $50, $40 and less. We're also looking at uh, new energy sources actually coming into line and providing energy for our societies. Uh, we have um, a magnificent cast of uh, people who've been working in the industry for a long time. Um, right in front of me, Ignacio Sanchez Galan. He is the head of Iberdrola, uh, a Spanish company that does most of its work outside of Spain. Uh, he's been uh, in, in the energy business uh, for many years. At, at the same time, Ignacio Sanchez Galan is also the president of the University of Salamanca, Spain's oldest university. Samir Vico, uh, he's the chief executive officer of Amec Foster Wheeler. This is a UK company that uh, specializes in providing uh, engineering services to companies in the energy sector uh, throughout the world. Uh, we have uh, Tomás González Estrada. He's the Minister of Mines and Energy of Colombia. Uh, Colombia is um, a very little known example of success in the energy field. Uh, not everyone thinks of Colombia as a major powerhouse in, in the energy sector. However, uh, the development of energy sources in Colombia has been remarkable over the, the past few years. Emilio Lozoya is the Chief Executive Officer of Pemex, Petróleos Mexicano. Uh, a company that is undergoing a transformation. It was a government monopoly in oil uh, for many years in Mexico. Now it, it is facing competition in the light of the new energy reforms that have taken place in Mexico. I do want uh, to thank all of you for being, uh, for being here with us uh, in this uh, World Economic Forum, a future of energy debate. Ignacio Sanchez Galan, uh, you you are a man who's been in the, um, in the energy sector you know, for, for your entire life, but your grandfather was an energy producer. Your great-grandfather was an energy producer. Uh, you're heading a company that, that was born in Spain, but that is doing business all over the world. What, what are you encountering? Is it, is it difficult for a company, uh, for a Spanish company, to go outside of Spain, outside of Europe, and do business all over the world? Well, I think, as you mentioned, we are a company who were born in 1901, over 100 years old. Always, we have been private. Most of our utilities have already been in part of the history of state-owned. We've never been a state-owned. Always have been private. And you mentioned my grand-grandfather, one of, one of the founders of a small thing, the, the father of uh, grandfather of my predecessor, who was another small one, et cetera, et cetera. We've been joining, joining forces across a century. And I think that is what we did internationally. In one moment, we are now by far, and uh, 15 years ago, we were by far the largest in Spain, but we decided to internationalize ourselves. How we internationalize? So uh, we move, as most of the Spaniards, first of all, to America. We have already, we came to Mexico. We are in Mexico since uh, 1999. So we are now, we have an important presence in Mexico. We are in Brazil. But we, we decide to expand our activities in Europe and the United States. Now we in the United States, we have investment of more than $30 billion. So we have presence in 24 states. We have the distribution and the power generation as well in, in Wales, in Scotland, and in, in part in north of England. So, and I think we've been moving in the direction. How we make? Using the experience of 100 years of mergerings and mergerings and mergerings. So I think we are the result of a company which joining forces, we demonstrate joining forces, the result is better than being alone. So I think the group war become global, and joining forces, you are more global, you are more competitive, you are learning, you can learn from one side to another one to do the things together. That is what we did. It was not difficult, it's just uh, we use the talent of whatever country we go for making the things in a different manner. And that is the result of the company. Now we are one of the four or five largest worldwide, and we continue expanding just in this moment, we are already, uh, just, uh, d d we decided to merge it with another American company, the distribution company in uh, Connecticut and Massachusetts, a part of New York and Maine that we are already present, so we are making that one. And we should do the in the same manner, joining forces, using the, the talent of those people what we can do, and sharing whatever experience we have already learned from one country to another one. That's our experience. 
Samir Brico, we are experiencing a revolution in the energy world. And it's not only prices. I mean, prices were up, they're down right now. We're also experiencing a technology uh, challenge, a technology revolution. How much is that affecting the market? How much is that affecting the future of energy? Well, I think uh, the most important thing, actually, is the revolution in the shale gas and the tight oil in the U.S. And that revolution has started with a new technology, which is about the flexible uh, horizontal drilling rather than just simply a vertical drilling. And that changed uh, the world quite a lot. Uh, you see the U.S. being a major consumer in the world. It is consumes about 25% of the energy uh, of the world. But also, it was at the same time, is importing more than 10 million barrels a day. And today, uh, the U.S., through the technology, has converted itself from being actually an importer to be soon an exporter of energy. This is one of the technology which has made a breakthrough. But it is not only about the horizontal drilling or flexible drilling. It is the speed which you can set up such an application. It is the speed that you can come up with uh, energy production. But also it is the speed, how, you ca how fast you can shut it down. So this is one of the technology which I made a breakthrough. The second one is, of course, is subsea activities and deep water activities, which we see, for instance, in Brazil and other places in the world. And these two combined has changed quite a lot in the, in the supply uh, side of the, of the energy equation. Is there a lot more pressure on the ecology side, uh, side of the uh, equation? We're seeing, uh, uh, you, you, you talked about um, fracking and uh, horizontal drilling. At the same time, we have uh, NGOs that are becoming far more um, Putting a lot more pressure on oil companies, is that, uh, how, how do you handle those pressures? And what, what do you do? How do you, what, what do you do in order to uh, reduce the impact on the ecology? So uh, at AMEC Foster Wheeler, we have about 8,000 scientists and expertise who are doing nothing else than environmental business. And they work side by side to the oil and gas team. So for instance, in the operations in the U.S., because of the... Uh, they say the geology and because of the technology on the horizontal drilling. So you are having quite a lot of methane actually flaring, which has not been that great. And that's why you could see, for instance, that the emissions in North Dakota is actually higher than the Great Lakes in the U.S. where the heavy manufacturing uh, uh, is located. And therefore, what we needed to do is that to rethink the whole uh, uh, drilling uh, possibilities. And what we are doing now today is making environmental impact studies about how do we do the actual drilling, how we make it more tighter in order to be uh, sure that no uh, gas get released. But there is an, a big environmental uh, issues and we need to tackle that. When you talk about uh, major energy producers in the Americas, you think of Mexico, you think of Venezuela, you think of uh, the United States, of course, but you rarely rarely think of Colombia. However, Colombia has been a major surprise in the energy sector over the past few years. Why is that? Why has, been, uh, why has Colombia uh, surprised the world, Tomás González Estrada? These are very interesting times for the energy sector. It's very encouraging and, and very interesting. We're very excited to see the steps Mexico is taking forward in the energy reform, not only the extent, but the pace at which things are moving. And I say this because Colombia did undertake similar reforms around eight to 10 years ago. And we did very similar things. We did three fundamental things. The first is we separated the energy, the national oil company. We decided the national oil company was going to become a company. And we created an agency to promote investment and to administer resources. We also created a more competitive contract. And we created a mechanism to attract investment, which were bidding rounds, like the ones Mexico will carry out and the results have been very, very good for Colombia. Uh, we multiplied investment by three. We actually we rank, I think, 12 or 14 in the world for attracting investment over the past five years. Secondly, we doubled production. And thirdly, we were able to increase revenue. And this is very important because in the end, it's about development. Energy, poly has to, energy policy has to be about development. And when you look at the pace at which we're building roads, we're reducing poverty, we're doing social investment, all of these things are tied up to the energy sector, to the revenues that come from oil, and these revenues are tied to reform. If you look at the past five to seven years, uh, we had a huge increase in prices. 
but not, all, not every country was able to increase production the way we did. So the story is not just a story about prices. It's a story about doing a proper reform and getting the benefits of reform after you do it. Mexico is undergoing a major energy reform right now. Uh, the uh, reform has been approved uh, in Congress, uh, passed by the president, approved by the uh, state legislatures. And now, now comes the uh, great matter of actually making it work. Uh, Emilio Lozoya, what are the problems that you are finding at Pemex uh, to make this reform work, at least on the part of, uh, of oil? Well, the, the energy reform is indeed one of the biggest transformations in the Mexican economy over the last decades. It has been passed at the constitutional and the secondary law level, and now uh, we've been implementing it uh, over the past six to eight months. But uh, sometimes we forget all of what has been done over the last six to eight months in order uh, to increase production. A number of new agencies have been created and have been staffed. You, for, you have to find the talent as well. There, uh, there were uh, also a process to strengthen the, the two existing agencies, the National Hydrocarbon Commission, which is modeled more or less after uh, the Colombian experience, and the Energy Regulatory Commission that will in particular regulate the prices and the tariffs of electricity, of the transportation of natural gas, of the prices of gasoline, etc. cetera. Uh, the government has also announced a number of bidding rounds that are historical by all means, I would say, in a global context. Why? Because the blocks that will be offered for companies, including Pemex and our competitors or partners, to bid for these blocks include not only exploration blocks, which mean these are areas that have not been explored and require a lot of risk investment, but there are also blocks that are being put for offer that have existing reserves. So from a risk standpoint, these are assets that have been de-risked and offer enormous potential in the short term uh, for investors. In Pemex, we're encountering a number of challenges, but we're tackling them one by one. And I would say our biggest challenge is execution. We need to transform the company in a relatively short period of time. We need to change the strategy, we need to change the structure, and we need to change the culture of the company. We have to execute hundreds of projects through alliances in the next 12 to 24 months. That is a lot. The company has never had such a challenge since its inception. But the way that we are going about this and mitigating the biggest risks that I see, which is implementation of all of these things at the same time, is through partnerships. Finding world-class partners to mitigate the implementation risk. That means we do not want to have overruns in costs. We do not want to have delays in the, in the projects that we're executing in drilling, in the construction of pipelines, in the construction of refineries, of petrochemical plants. And most importantly, Sergio, we, don't, we do not have money for everything. So we need capital to complement our efforts to make sure that the reform is implemented. We are conscious about the historical role that Pemex will carry out in the next months, and therefore we are not taking any risks on our own that we cannot execute on time and at cost. So uh, these are the three main elements. The change in strategy, we will be present only in those projects where we generate value, or more clearly said, where we make money. Okay. And we will be less present in those areas that offer less returns, but are, that are strategic to the company. So um, as you rightly pointed out, Pemex is transforming itself from a government agency into a corporation. It doesn't happen overnight, but we're committed to doing so, and I think we're on the right track. I remember uh, uh, Ignacio Sanchez Galán. I remember that uh, Iberdrola's color, corporate color, was blue, and now it is green. Is that uh, a signal to the people, to the consumers? Uh, is that, does that have anything to do with the vision of the future for energy? Well, I think it's an, an smiling because probably has been the most difficult decision I succeed than the board approved to me. So traditionally our color was blue because we were called hydro. We were hydro in the, from the beginning and the water is blue. And when I decided to move to another renewable right wing, I, decided, I proposed to the board to move from green to blue, from blue to green. It was terrific. It took to me three board meetings before it was approved. I think the last one, I came there and put the whole office just in green color and the board, the only thing could say to me is, well, okay, we are said green, but I have to be the green Alcantara. Said, I don't know what the green Alcantara, but it's green, let's go, okay, fine. <laughs> so uh, and, and so uh, uh, we, we are already, 
we uh, think that the, uh, our society have a responsibility toward to leave uh, to the future generation a world at least as good as this one we have already retained. And I think that is one of our goals, that is on top of our agenda, that is on the top of our commitment. And I think uh, uh, the things can be done in a manner. The world has already a lot of resources, and using the resources, natural resources, in a certain manner, we should be able to reduce drastically the emission we are already emitting to the, to the, to the, to the atmosphere. So uh, 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 we are now in the, on the December this year is a summit in Paris, which is uh, 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 what probably is one of the latest opportunities that the world took seriously, then the climatic change is a fact. So we as a company, we are putting our grains to try to, 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 to facilitate this thing. We have already signed on the World Economic Forum uh, uh, environment. We have already signed 40 leaders, 40 business leaders, just a commitment just to try to do so. We as Iberdrola, we have already committed ourselves to reduce even more our emission. We are now 30% emitting less than average European average, but we have already committed for 230 to reduce another 50% toward our emission in, uh, in 2007. But I think it's, uh, uh, green is a sign, but the most important thing apart of the color is that we, human beings, we have a responsibility to give to our uh, future generation a better world. I think we have not right to destroy the things that we've been destroying just in a generation, banning and doing things in a manner which is not efficient. World, the world needs energy, and we have to do the things using the energy, but using the energy in the proper manner. And I think all the energies are needed, but we have to use the better technologies in such a way that these technologies with the energy efficiency, we pollute it as less as possible. And that is possible, and that uh, can be made already uh, economically viable as well. It's not a question to make technologies which are not absolutely very expensive, which is already affecting to the competitiveness. Is able to be made the things with technologies which are enough mature in using models which that can happen. And that is, in my opinion, one of the greatest opportunities of Latin America. Latin America energy demand is going to multiply by four in the next 24 years. That means the huge investment are needed. And this investment can be made in a manner uh, efficient, uh, environmentally, economically, or inefficiently. And I think the opportunity is to be efficient. And I think I'll be delighted if Latin America takes the flag of we can be the greenest of the greenest. We can be the most efficient environmentally. Because that would be a good example. If not, another nation is going to force, then we move in this direction. So uh, that is the reason of the green. Gonzalez Estrada, can we really be the, uh, the region of the world that, that, uh, that has the banner that we're producing energy, we're doing it efficiently, but we also do it in the most uh, eco-friendly manner that is possible. Can we do that? Can you do that in Colombia? I, I would start by saying that blue is green. In Colombia, 70% of our electricity is generated through hydro. It has been very useful for us uh, in terms of managing these tensions that sometimes you get between, between environment and energy. Uh, and I think we can we can really take advantage of the huge resources we have, but we have to take into, into, course, into consideration a couple of things more. Uh, the first is that we need to make sure, at least that's the approach we've taken in Colombia, that we let projects compete on their merit. What we've seen is a dramatic reduction in costs for renewables, for, for non-conventional renewables, uh, and they will be able to participate without subsidies. Prices do send signals. It's very important that we let projects compete on their merit because that's the most e efficient and the most permanent way in which we can get renewables flowing. And the other thing which has to do with renewables and with a huge problem we have here in Latin America is energy access. We have the, the, the numbers I have in my head are that roughly the equivalent of Peru, of the population of Peru, is the amount of people in the region that don't have access to electricity or to reliable sources of energy. And in many areas, in remote areas in the region, it's through renewables, through the local renewables that are available, that we will be able to secure this energy access. So innovation and, and, and social investment need to partner in a way in which we can not only be green, but we can have access for all. Samir, prices of uh, crude oil have dropped by 50% over the past uh, year and a half. Is this affecting investment, or is it just changing investment? And what do you foresee for the future? 
the view on the energy prices on the longer term that is going to be higher than what it is, of course, today. Uh, but, of course, what we have been seeing in the last uh, nine months is uh, in an equilibrium in the supply and demand, uh, mainly driven first by what's happening in the U.S. with the shale gas and, and the production in the U.S., but also uh, the geopolitical situation in the world, which has a major impact on the supply and the demand. And there is another factor which we should also think about is the Chinese consumption. Uh, because in China, the, the forecast in the past and the GDP growth has used to be between 7 to 8 percent over two decades. And this has been a fantastic story. But we do understand the economy in China today is almost triple what it used to be about some time back. And the forecast for Chinese uh, GDP growth is about now 6.8 percent, which is lowering uh, let's say the consumption, and that is going to be changing the balance between the supply and demand. And because of that, we're seeing a, a, a lower oil price. Uh, the view of the industry is that we are going to see a U-shaped recovery rather than a V-shaped recovery. So uh, we need to be patient. It means uh, it's a gradual recovery. It's a gradual recovery. Mm -hmm. But I don't think is that it doesn't look like we'll be seeing prices above 70 or 75 dollars for the next couple of years. Depending on the geopolitical situation, depending on what's going to happen in Russia for the European base, what's going to happen uh, in the situation, for instance, in Yemen, in Syria, and Iraq, whether that is going to be inflicting uh, and, and increasing the conflict in the region, whether Iran is going to open up or not, whether the sanctions are going to be lifted up, because we can get quite a cheap oil, actually, and gas. Uh, from Iran. So there are a number of issues which are changing the equation. The reforms which we are seeing today, both in Mexico and Colombia, this is a fantastic opportunity. I mean, if uh, Emilio will deliver on what he said he's going to do, mm -hmm. he's going to double the production. But we do understand also at the same time that reforms are not easy. Uh, reforms take time. Uh, reforms will require actually you need to have strong institutional and regulatory frameworks beyond not to that to work, beyond the, the short cycle of the political uh, uh, mandate which we have. And, and Emilio was speaking about cost, he speaks about schedule, he speaks about capital, he speaks about technology, but also the context needs to be correct. And if we are able to create a context in Latin America, for instance in, 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 in Mexico, in Colombia, in Brazil, in Peru, <coughs> and many of the places in Latin America which is very rich actually in resources, that can make miracles. Uh, Emilio, uh, Tomas was saying, and I was very uh, struck by it, uh, which is something uh, everyone recognizes in the economic world, but not everyone recognizes in the political world. Prices do send signals. Prices tell us what's working and what's not working. We should allow projects to uh, develop according to their merits. Uh, Mexico has traditionally have uh, control, uh, controls or subsidies in, in oil prices and gasoline prices in all kinds of energy prices. Is this being uh, phased out? Uh, what can we expect in prices? And uh, do we, uh, are we going to see in Mexico a situation in which prices will speak for themselves and allow uh, production, uh, you know, production to fluctuate or certain projects to be uh, given precedence over other projects? Well, the, the law is, is very clear in this, and this was part of the energy reform. Prices for gasoline and diesel will be liberalized, fully liberalized uh, by 2018, in terms of importation of uh, products to, to Mexico. And there, there's a transition to that. That will go by very quickly. And there's an important element to that. Pemex needs to invest a lot in infrastructure to make sure that we as a country do not write off a lot of the investments that we have done in refining capacity. Uh, but the most important part is, and I agree, costs need to send a signal. When you speak about Mexico in this very difficult context for the uh, global uh, oil and gas producers, Mexico offers a very good opportunity. Our all-in cost of production in Pemex, which is more or less what other companies will face that will come and explore uh, and extract oil and gas, is $24, $25 per barrel all in, including exploration, the drilling, and the development of the infrastructure. At current prices, close to 60, the Mexican price of, uh, of our um, oil, in Mexico this offers a highly 
competitive environment to produce more energy. And when we speak about Latin America, North America, I am highly optimistic when you put into context the technology that Samir was referring that catalyzed a complete change in the shell oil and shell gas production in the US. Production has, we have to look at the figures. They used to produce in the United States 4.5 million barrels per day five years ago. Now they are above 9 million barrels per day. It's a doubling of the production, something that I don't, I don't recall anyone predicting it. Mexico is highly competitive on conventional oil, which is even more uh, easy to extract than the non-conventional oil that they're extracting in the United States. Plus what Colombia is doing and what Brazil has done in terms of reforms. At the end of the day, I am highly optimistic about the development of Latin America and North America in terms of energy production, but it will have a particular impact, which is on productivity. It's not about producing. You don't, you don't need to think about the volumes of production. It is about energy's use for transport. Energy is used to produce other uh, products. And at the end of the day, the cost of natural gas, for example, in Mexico or in uh, the United States is a third or a quarter of what other parts of the world are paying for. And this is, it's obviously Pemex will generate some value in the process, but at the end of the day is the impact that it has on the local economy, on the job creation, and on the GDP creation of the country. So that is what makes me very optimistic about uh, both Latin America and North America, including uh, US and, and Canada. Ignacio Galan, um, I know in Mexico we've just had uh, an energy reform that changes the rules, not only in oil, but also in electricity. But you were working in Mexico before the energy reform. Uh, how, how much do the rules change now? Uh, what uh, are you going to be able to do now that you weren't able to do before? And what sort of projects would a private company like yours, Iberdrola, be contemplating in Mexico? Well, I, I think we are here, as I mentioned, since 1999. We are in this moment a several power plant, roughly 15, between 15 and 20 percent of the electricity produced in Mexico is produced in our power plants. We have uh, mostly this electricity is already sold to uh, CFE, but there are certain private customers as well, but we are already selling that one. What this uh, represent? I think this reform, I think, is a real uh, revolution. Revolution in the sense of trying to do something in a hurry, which certain countries has already taken decades for liberalization, but they are already very good thing, for very good starting point, is that Mexico, as far as our experience, always has already demonstrated that the legal certainty is a fact. So whatever thing has already happened across this year, always has already respect the terms of the agreements or the contracts we have already signed. And that is very good a starting point, because for investment we require 40, 50, 60 years uh, a period before you recover the investment, legal certainty is, is crucial. I think the, the, the track record of Mexico uh, in energy has already been always maintaining and respecting the rule. The second thing is that they are already making the thing in a manner, progressive manner, which is good. So they are liberalizing the most industrial consumers in two steps, which I think that gave time for those people which are coming to do things in a, let's say, planified manner. With another thing which is important, planning is crucial. In Mexico, they are already, this liberalization is on the way, but it's a good planning, creating already independent regulators. They are already giving free access, equal basis access to everybody to the network. So they are doing the things in a point which I'm sure then is going to attract a lot of people to come here. Uh, they are place for everybody. I think they, the, the competition is a starting, but I think it's a country in the next few years will require investment. Uh, they, they need to build on the size of 50, 60,000 mega, new megawatts. So it means almost as, as much as most they have already today. So they need to make a lot. So they, they are room for everybody, but the important thing is what they are already making in this reform is, is a, a very a, a well-designed, is uh, attractive, and they are putting all the means which is required for the investors to come into the country. So I uh, answer uh, is, uh, if we've been already in the previous period without these rules, I think we are much more satisfied now with the existing rules. In this moment, we are already uh, uh, ongoing investment in the range of 16 or 15, 16 billion uh, 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 
pesos, Mexican pesos, or one billion dollars, something else. But I think our plan is uh, almost to double the existing investment in the country. Up to now, we are four, five billion invested, and we plan, uh, we wish to at least to double the size by the end of the decade. And I think we are quite satisfied, and I, we are very happy how the things are being done and how the the, uh, not only uh, uh, in terms of the legal framework, but as well all the uh, uh, independent regulator has been established in this period, which I think that's very good. I'm surprised to hear that uh, legal certainty, that the rule of law is a major, uh, uh, a major advantage of Mexico. Uh, we Sometimes Mexicans, we don't uh, believe that, although I guess if we look at other countries in Latin America, you know, we realize that uh, there's more respect for contracts and agreements. Is that, is that what you're saying? Well, I, I will not criticize another okay, one, I, I, but I, 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 will, I would like to say that Mexico really is respecting the rules, which I think, I insist, for investment, which uh, when we take the decision to invest in a power plant, this power plant is going to stand for 30, 40, 60 years. So a, a, a legal certainty, a legal framework, predictability, stability of regulation is crucial for ourselves. I think we are looking even more than one than profitability. I think we are expecting profitability, but to predict profitability across 60 years is almost impossible. All, all the paper can resist anything. But if you are not, if you have already a, a, a good trial record or legal uh, uh, respect of the, of, the, of the rules, so that is the main thing for attracting investment in our sector. Samir, uh, I don't know how much work um, uh, Anne Foster Wheeler has, has done in Latin America, but what's your experience with Latin America? What sort of problems do you encounter, and what are the advantages of working in Latin America? The plus and the, and the cons of Latin America. L let me start with the cons, maybe. So okay, that, that's that, all right. That affect a little bit more. <laughs> I mean, uh, of course, uh, I mean, we have been active uh, across whole Latin America. Uh, we have been uh, uh, having challenges definitely in getting paid in countries like Argentina and Venezuela. Uh, I so guess you're not been, the only ones. But <laughs> no, but I mean, I joined the team anyway. So it, it has been a quite a difficult uh, situation for us. So, so that's, a, that's a major problem for a company. That's uh, when, when Mr. Galan speaks about uh, legal certainties. That's, that's important. That's very, very important for everybody because you would like to have the political stability. You would like to have the economical stability. You would like to have the fiscal stability. Uh, you would like to have the rule of law to be there, and you want to have a resolution bodies which you are able actually to go to and find a solution on time and not to wait for too long in order that you can uh, get the resolution and get your money out of, of the country if it's needed. Now, uh, but, that's, but that's on some of the challenges we have been having. Uh, Brazil has been a, a also a big challenge in the sense of that uh, building up uh, the facilities in, in Brazil with a very high degree of local content while the actually manpower and the talent, the skills were not there. So they were a little bit ahead of themselves, which I think also is going to be challenged both in, in Mexico and also in Colombia, because this is the two countries which we see are the rising stars actually in Latin America. Does it, do they have the same kind of uh, rules for local content in Mexico and in Colombia? Well, I mean, I, I think that, the, no, they don't have the same rules as it is in, in Brazil. But, but the thing is that what we need to be careful, and we have been having a discussion quite a lot also with Emilio about, in the transformation of many of the companies in, in, in Latin America, well, what we need to do is that we need to have a very clear plan about how are we able to build the talent over time. Because if you will be going from 2 million barrel a day to 4 million barrel a day, you will definitely need more uh, uh, firepower. You need more talent. You need more, more skills. But it will take some time to build up the skills. Because what you need to do first is that you need to excite students to study engineering. You need to get engineering schools to be able to deliver the right quality of engineers. And then you need to be able to capture the engineers rather than going to the finance uh, 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 market and in order to be able to work as good engineers, and they need to work for a number of years before they start to be productive. And that's going to be a challenge in many places in, in, in Latin America, as the growth is going to be on a very fast pace. So we need to have a very clear plan about what does it take us in order to get there, and how are we able to prepare on a, on a, on a, on a phase basis all the talent which we need. Emilio, uh, tell us about that. Uh, what's the situation in Mexico with respect to talent? I've been told that uh, not only by, by Sa Samir, but by many people that the, uh, the world's uh, scarcest resource is talent, in spite of the fact that we have widespread unemployment throughout the world. 
Uh, is Pemex being able, is Pemex getting the uh, talent, the engineering talent that it should be getting in Mexico? Or are schools good enough, the public schools, the private schools, the, the techs, uh, are they good enough and are they providing a uh, sufficient number of engineers? I, I fully concur with, uh, with, with Samir on identifying the challenge of human capital as the, the most important one we will face Maybe not in two years, but surely in a, you know, three, four, five years, this will start to become a real issue. Mexico has great engineering schools, uh, both public and private. It is producing a large quantity of engineers, but not necessarily with the skills that companies need uh, as soon as they are employed. So you need to invest a lot, again, in retraining them for whatever you need. But needless to say, uh, as more companies come in, the geology is uh, generous both in Colombia and in Mexico and in Brazil. So the, the, the talent market is global, it's not local. Uh, either you build talent or you buy talent. Mm -hmm. If you buy talent, you push up the prices. And we know- But what about immigration laws sometimes? Mexico has very restrictive immigration laws. We ought to flexibilize them because at the end of the day, uh, you need to move. Uh, the resources around and one of the most critical one or if not the most critical one is talent. I would say Mexico has the right capacity we just need to work on an industry basis and not as a loner in making sure that we collaborate with, with the universities. There is talent around but it is not being taught in what I would say a coherent and organized way. We need to standardize the curriculum of the universities so that we know what we're hiring and this is something that you know, Pemex used to be the only employer or the electricity, national electricity company. So the, it was not a, a big issue. But now that there will be a competition for talent, this is going to become a problem. You just need to look at Australia or some projects, for example, in Brazil, where the cost of the project doubled or tripled because they did not find the right amount of people. So, uh, but that brings me back to the local content issue. Mm -hmm. Mexico is one of the largest and most open economies in the world. Uh, more than 65% of our economy is trade. So in implementing the reform, we've learned from other experiences that it is better not to put high restrictions, some ambitions in terms of constructing equipment, making sure that some of the value of the equipment uh, uh, construction is carried out in Mexico, but not putting such a high mark where you just escalate the cost of the project. So. Uh, my sense, but I, I, I leave this to, to, uh, to the other participants, is that local content laws that were approved as part of the energy reform are actually a non-issue because importing equipment to construct or implement large-scale combined cycle projects or offshore projects, uh, actually it's, it is much cheaper to, produ to produce part of the equipment here because energy is cheaper, gas is cheaper. Mm -hmm. So I'm optimistic about that and uh, at least from what I heard from other companies, it is not a risk that they foresee, but the talent one is a problem. Minister Gonzalez Estrada, what's the situation in Colombia with respect to talent? It, it's always when, when you have such an increase in production, remember we doubled production to a million barrels per day over the last five years. This stresses the system in a lot of ways. So there are requirements for talent, of course. Uh, there are requirements for local content uh, communities in the ground, and this is something Mexico will experience because when you, once you have lots of companies, communities in the ground are going to demand and expect a lot from the projects that are carried out close to them. And this is going to, 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 to be a difficult thing to manage because you have to make sure the companies that operate follow standards that are acceptable and that are proper for all. The licensing and the permitting system, this is also something that can be stressed when you receive a lot of investment. You will need to approve environmental licenses, you will need to carry out community consultation processes. So reform brings a lot of, of benefits. It does bring a lot of benefits, but it also requires a lot of effort from the government to be able to, to support the projects on the ground. If you say, I want investment because this will bring resources for investment, this will bring energy, this will secure a lot of things, you need to be prepared to follow through in terms of policy, not only in local content, not only in talent, but also in making sure the projects happen in the ground. Uh, Ignacio Galana, I understand Iberdrola has brought a lot of good engineers, Spanish engineers, Euro European engineers to Mexico, but I understand they marry Mexicans and they stay in Mexico. <laughs> Is that a gain or a loss? <laughs> no, I, I think I, think I, I absolutely uh, 
I agree with Emilio, he was saying, I think Mexico is in long time, extremely good engineers. I, I, I just already mentioned uh, to you in some moment, I think I finished the university in engineer uh, in 1972, yesterday, you can imagine. And at that time, most of the books, I was already studying my engineering school, were already books who has already either written in the Tecnológico de Monterrey or translated in the Tecnológico de Monterrey that we are using. I think my learning in electric machine, my learning in external material, my learning in switches has already come in from Monterrey. So, yeah, uh, and I think Mexican, uh, Mexican, Mexican <laughs> uh, even certain words, we are using the Mexican word, uh, uh, relevadores, the switches in, 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 in español, decimos, we call interruptores, in Mexico they, they call rele relevadores. We are using the word relevadores, still because okay. I'm in this one. But I think in the point he mentioned, I think the engineers here are very good. Our experience with the Mexican engineers are extremely good. So. Uh, almost everybody in our company are engineers. We are recruiting in this moment 60 or 80 new engineers. I think is we are already providing, as he mentioned, certain scholarship in certain European, uh, British, and American universities for certain specialization. But I think the electromechanical engineer, which is our specialty, which is produced here, are extremely good. Such that uh, one of the largest uh, power plants we have already built in Middle East, in Qatar, has been mostly made and designed by uh, Mexican engineers. So uh, we are already, uh, these engineers are already, the industry, auxiliary industry in this country, the electromechanic industry, is very good. The, uh, uh, I, I, I subscribe, and they are absolutely competitive in this industry in this country in very many fields, such that in certain equipment we are exporting to other countries. Uh, area like transformer, for instance, cable transformer are much cheaper produced here in Mexico than in Segur. In certain of, the, uh, of our power plants uh, in the world, they are already using this uh, Mexican equipment. So I think it's a good people. The universities are still maintaining a very high level for our specialty, electromechanical, which unfortunately in another country, the United States, is not in fashion. So they are not very many electromechanical engineers. They prefer to be already electronic or telecoms or IT engineers, but the traditional uh, electromechanic engineering, there are not very many. Here is maintaining that one, and that is already using these engineers because really they are very good. So uh, I, I think that's positive. In terms of uh, uh, specialization in certain particular fields, it's true, but I think the universities, no one university in the world can already provide precisely what we require in one particular moment in the industry. And that's why we have already our training centers, and that's why we spend a lot of money in training of all these, these guys. But the basic training in this country, the education, basic education engineering is very good. I take note that you have a good uh, view of Mexican engineers. You didn't answer the question of whether your Spanish engineers were very Mexican. <laughs> uh, uh, women understand it is true. <laughs> But, uh, but it uh, could be the other way around. It could be actually Spanish engineers, uh, female engineers, are marrying Mexican and men. Maybe it, it may be <laughs> so. We <laughs> have this experience already. <laughs> it, it may be so. What, are, what can we expect for the future? The, the, uh, the main issue here is the future of energy. What can we expect? Uh, let me start with you, Samir. What, what, where do you expect this business to be in 10 years? It's, of course, um, uh, Mark Twain used to say, never prophesy, especially about the future. But this time, I'm going to put you on the spot. Uh, what can we expect in the future of energy? Uh, I think we do all agree uh, that Latin America, in the last decades, it has been a sleeping, in a way, continent, and from an economical point of view, because we, you could not see any major GDP growth. And I think now the world has changed quite a lot, and Latin America have even changed even more. Uh, so I think in, in, if I see what's going to happen in the next 10 to 20 years in Latin America, because that's the question mm -hmm. is. Uh, in energy, in, you know, of course, Latin energy America and Latin America or energy in, in total? Energy, in energy. Ah, what, energy. What can in total. we expect? Uh, okay, exactly. so I mean, let, let me take advantage of your expertise. You're working good. all over the world. So, uh, so let me go through then the, some of the technologies, what I feel about. So um, the forecast in, in 2030 that the world is going to be depending uh, one, uh, about 25% still on, uh, on actually on uh, coal-fired power plants. Okay. Coal-fired? 
Yeah, and uh, so that means Asia is that's, becoming... That's 19th century technology. Yeah, yeah, Asia is, is continuing to be the coal country for the next two decades because they've been making a major investment on coal-fired power plants. Now, still, they need to be uh, rejuvenated and retrofitted in order to be able to meet the emission levels, but still they will be online, mainly driven in China and, and India. So that's going to be about 25% is going to be a coal. Uh, about uh, 19 to 20 percent is going to be oil, so we will not be using oil as much as we've been using because oil is being used more now in the transportation sector rather than anything else. I don't think there will be any power plants in 20 years from now running on oil. It is only very few places where it is uh, remote areas where you don't have any other solution. Uh, the, the, the fuel which is going to be from a fossil fuel, uh, which is going to be the future fuel, is gas. Mm -hmm. Gas is going through the roof now. So we are going to go up maybe about to 27, 28% of the world capacity is going to be using gas. A gas is going to be used in many different applications in the power generation mainly, combined cycle power plants, but also going to be used in the transportation sector. Because you look on today's on, on transportation, for instance, when it comes to uh, vessels, uh, they will be using, in the future, LNG rather than using actually bunker C or oil. Uh, even cars and trucks could be actually moving to gas, so that's going to be different. And then also with the gas networks, that's going to be more used in the residentials and also in the industrial. So, so this is the three big ones. Mm -hmm. Now, there is the three small ones. Um, hydro is not going to increase. It's going to be around the 8%. Uh, this country has been a major hydro country, if you think about Brazil, if you think about Colombia. But Google Earth has already found all the rivers. So we will not be able to, to be putting more hydro uh, power plants. We'll be improving maybe the hydro plants. We'll be some mini hydro plants, but it's not going to be big change. So 8% on that level too. Uh, nuclear has very been interesting. Some of the countries are going to be shutting down the nuclear applications. Uh, we, we still have about some 400 units on operation in a worldwide basis. Uh, the number of the units are uh, going to increase only in five countries, which are remarkable, let's say, increase, others are not. These are going to be in China, this is going to be India, this is going to be Russia, this is going to be also in Korea and in, in the U.S. All other countries are not going to have a major nuclear. Some of them they will be shutting down, and that will be leave at the 8%. The biggest breakthrough through the technology and through because of the ecological constraints is renewable energy. Wind has been uh, the biggest one run in the last decade. Solar is now the new, actually, future. Uh, our company has built about 15% of the solar plants in the U.S., and we're going to continue to do that. We have built 30% of the wind farms in Canada, but that's only a, a tip of the iceberg. This is going to move from 2% basis today to 8% on a worldwide basis. That means the growth on a yearly basis for the next two decades is going to be more than 100% year-on-year basis. It's going to be interesting. Coal remains, but on the other hand, we have alternative uh, sources of energy. Uh, the floor is open for questions. If you want to ask uh, a question to the uh, speakers, or as you've probably heard, very good. This is the time to do it. Uh, I, know, I know people are intimidated by the cameras. Uh, uh, we have... Uh, Oh, right here in the back, and do we have a microphone there? Yes, go ahead. Uh, could you please tell us who you are? Yes, hi. Yeah, it's, it's all right. Hi, good morning. My name is Perla Buenrostro from the International Center for Trade and Sustainable Development in Geneva. Um, I would like if you could please comment about the G20 pledges regarding phasing out fossil fuel subsidies. What's your position on that? And uh, the representatives from Latin American countries, uh, well, I come more from the trade world. Uh, and for many years, um, uh, regional trade integration initiatives are there. We will have a briefing on the Pacific Alliance. What's your position or why are you discussing about integration in terms of energy in, in Latin America? What's the future in that regard? Thank you. Integration and the G20 promises. Uh, anyone wants to uh, tackle? G20 has been extremely, uh, um, well, extremely audacious, aud audacious by you know saying that uh, fossil fuels can be reduced significantly. What we're hearing from Samir is that uh, uh, virtually every source of fuel that we're using right now will be will still be uh, uh, in place uh, within 10 years. Uh, is that 
inevitable, uh, Emilio? I, I think that uh, Samir's view is very realistic. Obviously, everyone in this room will probably uh, aspire to have 20% of renewables in 20 years, but the technology and the price are still not aligned. Uh, it might, but I think uh, realistically, hydrocarbons are going to continue to power the world for the next uh, decades. But hydrocarbons can be also much cleaner. Okay. I put uh, the example of Mexico, and uh, Ignacio also mentioned this. Mexico is going through a tremendous transformation on the consumption of energy. We are going from liquids, basically oil, to natural gas. It is two or three times cheaper in terms of energy consumption, and at least half as less polluting natural gas. I put the example of Pemex. What is the impact of going from hydro from uh, liquids, from oil, to natural gas? We are the largest consumer of electricity in the country, with 6% of total demand today. By being more efficient and deploying capital from third parties uh, and substituting fuel oil to natural gas, we will become a net supplier to the system of about 10% of total supply within three to four years. It is phenomenal. And when you talk about the reduction in emissions... You don't need to, 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 start, to stop using hydrocarbons to actually reduce uh, emissions. That's basically it. Correct. Yeah. And, and the, emissions are, the emissions reduction of this program, including the electricity company, which is also substituting fuel oil to natural gas, means as if you, you would take away various cities in Mexico and stop all the cars forever. So the, 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 the world could adapt to natural gas, as Amir was saying, and increase natural gas usage. I, I, I point to China, for example. If China substitutes, even mildly, coal and stops consuming more natural gas, you would see much cleaner cities. Evidently, we would prefer to see more renewables. But this will take time and a lot of investment in technology. So, and when you talk about integration, finally, Mexico is also involved in what I would say one of the biggest transformation in the world in terms of energy integration. We're building infrastructure. Already, actually, we inaugurated one pipeline, and uh, our fellow electricity company uh, will uh, inaugurate one uh, at the end of this year that will fully connect the natural gas market from Mexico all the way down to Canada. It's no longer one market in Mexico, it's a North American uh, energy market. And we're in, in uh, discussions to also bring natural gas to Central America that would drastically, drastically reduce the cost of energy from $20 a million of uh, cubic feet of, of gas towards the five, six, depending on the cost of transportation. So, means prosperity for the region. So I'm, I'm highly optimistic about uh, these two developments. Minister Gonzalez Estrada, any hope of more energy integration in uh, South America? Will we see uh, an energy agreement between Venezuela and uh, Colombia? Actually, <laughs> or, or is that too far-fetched? <laughs> no, actually, there, there are a lot of exchanges, uh, of energy exchanges between Colombia and Venezuela. Even when, when relationships with the two countries, between the two countries were so difficult, were so tough, we never stopped buying and selling electricity and never stopped buying and selling, and selling gasoline between the two countries. But there are two concrete examples of integration. One is the connection, the electricity connection between Colombia and Panama. This is a project that has been going on, going on at a good speed. We have the two main things already settled in the table. One is we know what's the infrastructure that needs to be built. And secondly, we have agreed on regulation, which are the rules to buy and sell electricity. If all goes well, the first electricity should flow between 20 and 2018. This means that all the market in Central America will be connected to South America through Colombia. And we are also advancing at a lower speed, because this is harder, connecting Colombia and Chile, trying to sell electricity from Colombia to Chile. They want to expand their mining with Colombian electricity, but we need to agree on how to buy and sell electricity between Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, and Chile. And this is, this is proving difficult. Any other question from the floor? Uh, anyone uh, over here? Yes, a microphone, please. Hi, this is Juan Carlos Guy from Ben & Company. I want to pick up on the talent point and risk management. This is an inherently risky industry. And uh, the question is, what can, with very aggressive targets of growth, what can equipment manufacturers, service companies, regulators, and operators collaborate to actually deliver on those targets and manage the risk that is going to inherently do both on safety and, and environmental risk? 
Okay, what do we do for risk, um, Samir? Uh, Samir. Well, I mean, according to the World Economic Forum, uh, there's in uh, has made a, a, a very thorough studies about uh, the projects which we are delivering in the world, and they were monitoring uh, all the project which has above one billion dollar, uh, mainly in the oil and gas industry, and uh, the the findings are appalling. Uh, the reason for that, because we found out that um, actually on a worldwide basis, uh, we are overrunning the budget with about 65 percent. It doesn't matter whether it is LNG or the downstream or upstream of the business. 75 percent overrun of the, budget, of the schedule. So we have an issue. So the industry in, in total did not deliver on the expectations which everybody should have or would have. And, and the view forward is that we need to get much a better collaboration between all the parties which you have mentioned. Because if we don't get that collaboration, we will be having an insane view about how the projects and how the risk are managed. So today, uh, there is a, a much better discussion and need to happen between the different parties in order to understand what is want to be achieved. What is the scope of supply? What is the vision of work and responsibility between the different parties? And what are the talents which are needed to be behind it? And there have been a number of mistakes done, and that mistake should be corrected. One of the mistakes is, has been done on, from the operator point of view. They felt, we have done this job about 10 years back, so add a couple of percent on it, so what's the problem? And from the service industry, we have been too lazy to inform, actually, our clients that this is not the situation. Look, as, as a responsible and accountable service industry to you, I need to be very clear about what is the new situation is, where do we stand on the supply chain, and what do we need to do different than what we have been doing before. We need to push more for simplicity in design, more actually in using standardized design, more modular design than what we have been doing. Look on so many facilities which we have in the North Sea, in the UK, in, in the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah? We have thousands of facilities doing the same thing. How does it look like? Everyone is different. Everyone is a bespoke design. And that's actually changed the whole risk picture. And that needs to be changed. Uh, we, haven't touched on, we haven't touched on nuclear energy, almost on nothing at all. Uh, Iberdrola manages a number of uh, nuclear plants. What's your view on nuclear? Is it safe? Well, it has already been demonstrated in the last 50 years that it really is a safe technology. So I think it's uh, uh, the number of, if we compare the number of accidents, uh, nuclear uh, with another technologies, is by far the, the, the safest of all those ones. I think if you see problems, we have already safest. happened. safest, that's not the impression yeah, people yeah, have. Yeah, but it's true. I think if you see, Hydropower plants, they already have already suffered disasters. Recently, a few years ago in Russia, they have a tremendous problem because uh, it just a dam breaks and they kill hundreds of people. So you see coal uh, power plants, they are already problems every day, accidents almost in daily basis. So uh, all technologies has already risked, it has already suffered. In the case of nuclear, the amount of money spent in, in, in security is such which that is never happening. When something happened, I think it's tremendous noise. It's not because of a nuclear accident. In the case of Fukushima, we have to remind that Fukushima was not a nuclear accident. It was already just a, 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 a earthquake. Earthquake and tsunami. Yeah. A tsunami, which already affected with all the protection. They had already a protection of 10 meters to protect of the waves. But uh, nobody can expect just a, a, a this size. Uh, which, uh, of, of, uh, uh, of tsunami, but it was a protection of that one, but it was a nuclear accident. Saying that, I think it's a, it's a question of, uh, of mentality. So if the, if the cities in certain countries, they have already created certain uh, concern or afraid around, so uh, that, that is a reality. But the fact is that they are, sa they are really safe. And what is the future? I think you mentioned. I think uh, still in the world there are a lot of countries which are already investing in nuclear power plants, so uh, another country, they have already decided not to do so. But I think my, my feeling is that uh, if, if we would like to have already uh, achieved the target that most countries is already fixing in terms of emission reduction, should be absolutely needed, then this power plant, those ones which are uh, still in, in good shape, remain open. The example of Belgium, 
Belgium had already decided, previous government, to close the nuclear power plant. Now they are coming back saying, please don't close, keep it open for another 10 years at least. Why? Because it's safe uh, enough, they are already demonstrated the, the reliability, they are already, the cost is competitive, and it's, it's a pity to, to uh, not emission, it's emissions free. Well, I do want to thank all of you for having participated in this debate. I want to thank the audience as well, both the audience here and the audience that has been watching us in, uh, through the web and that is going to watch us uh, in TV Azteca. Uh, Ignacio Sanchez Galán of Iberdrola, Samir Birko, Chief Executive Officer, Officer of Amec Foster Wheeler, Tomás González Estrada, Minister of Mines and Energy of Colombia, Emilio Lozoya, Chief, Chief Executive Officer of Pemex. I am Sergio Sarmiento of TV Azteca. This has been uh, the whole discussion, and uh, believe me, I've learned a lot. I hope you have too. Thank you very much for listening to us.